We are in a summer series called Passion, and last week we kicked it off and we talked about having a passion to serve, and this week we're going to talk about having a passion to worship, and I think all of us are called to be worshipers, and maybe for you, you're like me, you didn't grow up in church, and for you it's a little overwhelming, and you're like, how does this, ooh, I don't know about this, this is a little too much. And uh, so we're going to look at just some scriptures, because I think whenever we're battling with our emotions, our feelings, our flesh, we just got to say, well, what does God's word say about it? How many of you know that this is probably what should be the guide in our lives? And so I want us just to turn over to the book of Psalms, Psalms 100, and we're going to read a scripture here that we see this idea of worship and what it's meant to be in our lives and how we are to do it. And we're going to break it down a little bit more in the message. And after we read this, I'm going to pray and then we'll jump into the message. Is that all right? You good? Feeling good? All right. Here's what it says. Psalms 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people the sheep of his pasture. Listen to this, verse four. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with what? Help me out. Praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. In Jesus' name, amen. Why don't we pray? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active and it has the power to change our lives. And I pray that even now as we dive more into it, that you would soften our hearts, help us feel encouraged, help us leave better than we came in, Lord. And I thank you, Lord God, that your faithfulness didn't end with the generations of past, but it continues on to the future generations and it's present in our generation. And we pray that it would make a difference in our lives so that we can make a difference in other people's lives. We thank you for it. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. I can remember my first college game, football game. I grew up in the West Coast, and college football wasn't as big back then as it was in the Deep South. And I can remember as a freshman going to that game and coming up, and people were screaming and eating everywhere. I was like, they're just eating everywhere, all over the grass, all up in the parking lot. It's like they forgot to eat at the house, and they just like, let's eat at the game before we go in the game, and then during the game. And and people were shouting, and as I walked into those gates, it looked like a Roman Colosseum. I was like, what is this place? And I come in, and people's faces are painted. Their bodies are painted. Somehow they forgot their shirt, and their bodies are painted. And there's a live tiger on the field. I was like, what is going on? This isn't even safe. And uh, people are screaming and shouting, and they're singing songs I've never heard about. And after every play, old men, young women, they're all standing up the whole game screaming. And, and sure enough, I got caught up in it. And I started saying chants and things I didn't even know, but I got caught up in the emotion. And how many of y'all know that passion is contagious? And when you start to be passionate, when you start to just go, ah, people are like, yeah, let's do it. They don't even know what it is. You ever walk up on a group of people and they're just like standing around like, ah, and you're like, yeah, what, oh, what? Oh, yeah, that's not what I want to be about. <laughs> and I think that our lives should be so passionate that it's contagious. And how many of y'all know that Christianity isn't meant to be this contained and boring and private thing. It's meant to be a, a public thing, a thing where people see how good God is by the lives we live, by the things we say, by the things we do and the things we don't do. And we shared this scripture last week of Romans 12, 11, where it says, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. That word zeal is just this intense passion, this intensity about it. And, and I think sometimes people are trying to tone down Christians and tone down our worship and tone down our profession in the truth. And this scripture tells me, don't lose it. It says don't lose it because you can lose it. You, it says keep it because how many of you know sometimes you can find yourself and you've lost it. 
You've lost, lost that passion for life, lost that passion for your faith. And I found there myself there several times in my life, and I have to come back to the basics, come back to the very thing we're talking about this week and having a passion to worship. And, and too many times I think that we can be passionate about things that have no eternal value. And this scripture tells us, keep your spiritual fervor. Have a, have a spiritual dynamic to your life where you, there's a fervor, there's an intensity, there's a passion when it comes to your spiritual life, not like a frozen dead Christian that just doesn't even meet up, right? If you've been set free, if you've been forgiven of your past, if you've been redeemed, if no longer you need to live hopeless, if now you can have hope, now you can have purpose, how many of you know you should have a little bounce in your step? You should have a little excitement to your life. Well, that's just not the way I am. Well, break out of who you are. <laughs> We're going to look at Scripture and see what Scripture says, how we should live. How many of you know Jesus was a man of passion? You know, we see these videos and pictures of him, and he's just like, he's got his flowing hair, and he's like, what's up? I'm Jesus. That's not how Jesus was. <laughs> Jesus wasn't like California, like, dude, what's up? Yeah, my disciples. No, he was, he was a man of passion. It says that one time he came into the synagogue, which synagogue just means a place of gathering and meant to be a place of gathering for worship, worshiping the true God. And, and people had started to hold people back and start to exchange money in the place who was meant to worship and, and do it in an area where it discriminate against a certain kind of people. And it infuriated him. It's like passion rose up on him and he started kicking over tables and made a whip, started whipping things. And how many of y'all know? In that moment, some people could have been like, Jesus, calm down. I mean, a little too much, like, woo-hoo. But then they remembered that it said, a zeal for your house would consume me. See, a zeal for his house should consume us. A zeal for the things of God should consume us. Means that's what we're thinking about. That's what we're talking about. That's what we're posting about. That's what we're sharing about. That's what we're living about. That's what we're building. Jesus said, I will build my church and nothing will stand against it, not even the gates of hell. So guess what else we should be building? We should be building God's house as well. I came fired up. How many of you know, you preach it on passion, you better not come all weak sauce. So what is worship? So what is worship? What does that word worship mean? Is it just singing? Is it just when we're in here gathered together and the worship team's leading? Is that worship? I'm going to just give you a simple definition. Worship is just to show honor or reverence. I heard somebody say it like this. Worship is just bowing down to something or someone. And so it begs us to ask the question, what are we bowing down to in our lives? What are we bowing down to and saying, this is what I'm yielding to in my life? Are we bowing down to popular opinion? Are we bowing down to culture? Are we bowing down to what musicians say in their songs? Are we bowing down to our feelings, to our emotions, to our insecurities, to the things that are holding us back, to our secrets, to culture, to philosophy? What are we bowing down to? See, God says that we should only bow down to one person, and that's him. He said, you shall have no other gods before me. And he said, and this is the way you should live. He said, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your, all your strength and all your mind. He said, with everything. I love how the message translation says, love the Lord your God. All you godly ones, it says it like this, with all your passion, with all your prayer, and with all your intelligence. Yes, worship is a mental thing, but it also is a physical thing. It should be an emotional thing. It should be with everything you are, not just with some of you. God wants 100% allegiance. Worship is mental, but it also affects all the other parts. See, passionate worship isn't a personality thing. Some people are more outward, expressive, and emotional than other people. But no, passionate worship transcends personality. It is higher than our personality. By nature, I am an introvert, but I have learned that God, I don't need to be confined by just what I, what I am by naturally, but I need to give God what is due to him, whether it feels good to me or not, whether it is natural to me or not. I've learned to not let my personality be a limiter. 
Passionate worship isn't based on our personal comfort level either. Too many times people try to squeeze God into what's in the truth, into what's comfortable for them. But if the Bible says it, then it's true whether we're comfortable with it or not. And if we go the Bible way, even when it's not comfortable to us, how many of you know you will get the Bible results? You will get the Bible benefits in your life. And I don't know about you, I don't want the results and the rewards of just the world. I want God to reward me. I want God to bless my life. I don't want just the approval of everyone in culture. I want God's approval. I want God's blessing on my life. I want his presence in my life. His presence makes all the difference in our lives. And so how... Should we worship, you may ask. Whether we're in this building or we're outside of the building or whether you're in the campus you're at or whether in your house or in your workplace, how should we worship? Well, the ushers are coming at every location. They're gonna hand out some, some bookmarks that we've given out several times where we call them acts of praise or acts of worship. And uh, we're just going to look at some scripture because I think sometimes we think, well, is this, is this a life church thing? Is this a, is this a charismatic thing? Is this a, what is this? Well, no, this is a Bible thing that we're talking about today. And so we're going to look at these things and, I, and, and you could start looking at it. Sometimes we're like, don't look at it yet. Go ahead, look at it. And if you look on one side, it has a scripture. On the other side, it has several scriptures and phrases that we kind of have bolded. And so the first act of praise or first act of worship is just to sing. Listen to this. Sing to the Lord, all you godly ones. Praise his holy name. Singing isn't about you sounding good. Singing is about praising his holy name. Because let me tell you, I can't sing, but I can sing. I can't sing like Pastor Johnny Hill or Dwayne up here, but I can sing. I have vocal cords. I can open my mouth and words will come out of my mouth and it will praise the Lord. I can praise the Lord with my, with my words when we're singing. And I know sometimes people around me are like, you're killing my worship game, Mundo. I can hear you. Please calm down. And I'm like, I don't care about you. I care about him. I'm not here to impress everybody else. I'm here to show God how thankful I am for redeeming my life, for rescuing me, for pulling me out of the pit. And guess what? When it's time to praise, I'm going to praise. I'm going to lift up my voice. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing how great he is. I'm going to sing that he's amazing. I'm going to sing how he deserves all the glory and all the honor. Second verse, Psalms 47, one. Y'all need to calm down. Come, everyone. Do you read that? Not just some of you, not just some, the outward people, not just the super outgoing people. No, come, everyone, exclamation point. Clap your hands, exclamation point. Shout to God with a joyful praise, exclamation point. A lot of exclamation points up in there. But think about that. Clap and shout. I remember, because I didn't grow up in church, coming to a church like ours and thinking, these people clap a lot. I don't know if I, I mean, they clapping about everything. Like every, after everything somebody says, after every song, I'm like, I, what in the world are they clapping? So why are these people so happy around here? And you know what? It's because I hadn't given my life to God yet. And when I gave my life to him and he forgave me, I realized, Wow. I need to shout, I need to clap. So can we just do that? Can we just clap at every campus and just shout, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You're like, well, I don't like to raise my voice. Sometimes you just got to. Come on, the Bible says shout with the voice of victory. Come on, shout for joy. Can you just do it all together? Next verse, praise his name with dancing. You're like, all right, that's where we draw the line. <laughs> Ain't no dancing up in church. It's just not reverent. You're just thinking about the wrong kind of dancing. I'm not talking about your club and dancing. And I know you know how to do that. I've watched some of y'all. I'm like, ooh, they got some residue. They... <laughs> y'all forget for a moment where you are. Like, ooh, oh, oh, oh. I know. I'm not judging you. Use it. Use that gift to praise his name. Let me just say, in dancing, you may not be like, whoa, you may not be like, whoa, I'm going all out, but you can sway. 
You can bend your knees. You don't even need to leave the ground. Just move your hands around. It just looks like something's going on. No, but dancing is true. I mean, you think about it. When you're happy, you dance. And if you were to win a lot of money, you'd be like, ah! You, your team scores, you're like, yes! Well, how many of y'all know when we're worshiping the King of Kings who redeemed all mankind and gave his life for us and went to hell, grabbed the keys of life and death and came back and made it possible for all of us to walk in freedom? How many of you know you could be like, this isn't too much? It isn't too much. As a matter of fact, it shows jubilation. It shows that you're happy. It shows that you're excited. It shows that you're happy about something in your life because somebody's done something for you that you didn't even deserve. Psalms 134, verse 2, lift your hands, lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Think about that. Can we just do that all together right where you are? Just lift up your hands. You're like, I've never done it before. Here you go. Everybody's doing it at the same time. Nobody's looking at you. You know, lifting up our hands is a sign of surrender, universal sign of surrender. So you're like, what am I, why do we lift our hands? Because the Bible says it. And how many of you know it's a sign of just saying, God, not my will be done, but your will be done. Not my way, but your way. Not my purposes, not my thoughts. Your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. Lord, I surrender my life. Lord, I don't want to try to do it on my own. I need you in my life. God, I lift up my hands in the sanctuary to surrender, to worship, because you're worthy of it all. Acts 4.24. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. The fifth thing is prayer. It's prayer, praying out loud. And I know sometimes maybe you're like me where I didn't grow up praying, so that was awkward in, in itself. I can still remember the first time I was in a group of people and you, everybody's going around doing the circle prayer thing, you know what I'm saying? And you squeeze your hand at the person next to you when it's their time to, to pray. And, and, and you're like, oh, God. the whole time I was just sweating. I was like, these people are they're thinking I got a, like a sweating problem and I'm sweating and I know it's coming. And I'm like, I've never prayed out loud because I was thinking it's about how I prayed instead of who I was praying to. And that I didn't have it in my mind that prayer is an act of worship, that I'm thanking God and I'm telling him how good he is and I'm inviting him into my life. I'm surrendering. I'm opening up. So sometimes you just got to pray. And let me just encourage you when we're, somebody's up here and they're like, let's pray together. That's not the time to say, well, let me check the score. Let me check Instagram. Let me check Snapchat. What's going on? That's the time where we all pray. And you may be like, well, what do I pray? Just agree with whatever somebody's saying up here. Or you start praying on your own. If we're like, let's pray for our city, you start to pray for our city. Let's do that right now. Father, we thank you for, Lord, our city. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, that you're moving on us. We pray for your blessing on our city. You know when somebody say, you're like, yes, Lord. Bless our city. Yes, God. Move in our city. Yes, God. Be for us and not against us, God. Yes, Lord. Help us. And when we all just raise our voices, how many of y'all know? It just makes a difference. It's worship. It's showing God that we are honoring him. We're reverent. We're bowing down to him. Acts of praise. So why should we worship, you may ask. Talked about how and uh just give you a few thoughts that I kind of wrote down and, 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 and I, I use this in my life and I pray that even tomorrow morning when you wake up that you would think about this, that the first thing you would do, that number one, why we should worship is to get into the presence of God. Psalms 100, we started with that scripture. I want to reference that several times for these points, but Psalms 100 says, verse one, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth, worship the Lord with gladness, listen to this, come before him. It's coming into his presence. Come before him with joyful songs. Let me just tell you, you can't wait until you feel like worshiping to worship. You worship to get into the presence of God. And in his presence, there is fullness of joy. The Bible says that our joy is, his joy is our strength. And when our joy in God can get so full, it starts to outweigh every other emotion, every other fear, every other thing that's starting to feel like it's crushing and overwhelming us. It brings a satisfaction. 
perfection and the fullness that no one else can bring. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. What is that saying? He's saying you will be satisfied like you've never been satisfied before. I'll fill you like you've never been filled. That void that you wonder how will it ever be filled, I'll fill it. No job, no relationship, no matter amount of money you can make, no house, nothing can fill that void that you feel on the inside like the presence of God. When we worship, it brings us into the presence of God. Listen to this Psalm, Psalm 16, 11. It says this, you made known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Why do we worship? Because it brings us into his presence and there is fullness of joy. Come on, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. The true pleasures, the pleasures that really satisfy your soul and the longing you have on the inside. See, when we praise God, his presence is here and he begins to move within the praises of his people. And let me just say, it doesn't have to happen here. It can happen in your room. I did it this morning when I woke up, put on, open up Spotify, put on a worship song, and I just started to pray because I needed to get into the presence of God. And his presence begins to heal us and set us free and renew our minds and refresh our souls. That's why the book of Ephesians says this. It says, don't be filled, don't be drunk or don't be filled with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And let me just encourage you, don't focus on the don't, focus on the do here. He says, be filled with the Spirit. Listen to this, speaking to one another with psalms, singing, making, singing songs from the Spirit, sing and make music from your heart, and always give thanks to the Father. See, he's like, be filled with the Spirit, so not that it just makes a difference in your life, but that you can start singing and and speaking psalms and speaking truth to other people. See, that's what our life is meant to happen. In the private, we spend time with him. We get into his presence. He fills us with joy. He fills us with his presence. And then we start to bring his presence and his joy into every environment, into that job you say is so bad, into the darkest environments. We are the light where there is dark and light, come on, is meant to shine where there is no hope. You start to get filled up. Why do we worship? Because it gets us into the presence of God. Why do we worship? To bow down before God, number two. And I men- mentioned that as meaning of worship, but really it's you're, you're yielding. You're saying, God, not me, but you. You remind yourself when you're worshiping that it's God that's in control and not you. You're surrendering. Psalms 100 verse 3, continuing in that psalm, says, know that the Lord is God and it is he who made us and we are his. We are his people. We're his people. You know, you're like, that's my people. We are his people. We are his people. Sometimes I think we count ourselves out because of what we've done what we've been in the middle of, what our past was like, what our abuse was like, what are the things that we've faced, what are the things we've said, and guess what? You're always his people. You are made by him, for him, and when you worship, you're bowing down to who you are and whose you are. You're saying, God, I'm not in control, you're in control. And you remember, and I really felt this as I was preparing this message, that sometimes I think, And when people come to Christianity, they think, wow, the sacrifice is so great. What I'm being asked to surrender is too much. And let me just tell you, you can't outgive God. You can't outgive God. Whatever you think he's asking you to give up, he's asking you to give that up because there's something on the other side of that sacrifice. And you can never see what he ultimately has for you until you let go of certain things. So why do we worship to bow down before God. Can't forget that there are benefits when we do that. The Bible says, don't forget all the things that come 
with living a bow down life, that he forgives us, he heals us, he redeems us, he crowns you with love and compassion, he satisfies your desires and renews you. Come on, he's in control, he's bigger than anything you're facing, he's bigger than any challenge, anything you're going through right now. He loves you, he has a great plan for your life and when you come into worship with this attitude that he's in control, it's amazing how your perspective changes. You lift up your problems to his greatness and they just don't look that big anymore. More. You start to realize, God, there's nothing too difficult for you. See, you, that's why we sing, like, sing songs like that, because it starts to refresh you and it starts to declare something in your life and it becomes a chant. It becomes something that you can stand on. Number three, why do we worship? To show thankfulness. To show thankfulness. Psalms 100 verse four, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name saying thank you for all that he's done for you. Thankfulness, thanksgiving is such a powerful and spiritual discipline, something that you can get in the habit of doing instead of always cursing and blessing and complaining about the very things you prayed for one day. Come on, you think about that. When you pray for something, when you get it, you got to take care of it instead of complain about it, because then guess what? The next time you go ask for something, he's like, uh-huh, I remember last time you got something that I gave you. Come on, we're, we're to be worshipers, people that are thankful. The book of John says that time is coming and a time has come where true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, and they're the kind of worshipers that the Father wants. There's always a reason you could be thankful. Number four, why do we worship? To declare his faithfulness and goodness. To declare his faithfulness and goodness. Psalms 100 verse five, for the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. I tend to say that a lot of times when I'm praying because I want to remind myself he was faithful then, he's faithful now, and he's going to be faithful tomorrow. Whatever you're believing for, he's faithful. Whatever you're asking God, is this going to happen? He's faithful. It may be taking a little bit longer than you thought. He's faithful. What do you need to do in the waiting time? Just show your thankfulness. Just start to declare his goodness and his faithfulness in your life. So many times people put labels on us and we put labels on ourselves and labels just lock us in. You know, you'll never do that or I'll always be this or this is just who I am or nobody likes me or nobody cares about me or God does doesn't care about me and you're putting labels on yourself and you're locking yourself in in a place where not only are you keeping out hurt but you're also keeping out blessing you're also keeping out from the hand of God making a difference in your life I love how Dr. Caroline Leaf says that says this says labels lock people in telling them they're a sickly individual that cannot control his or her emotions or choices because of a disease that needs to be managed or a mistake that's been made by one wrong, wrong doing, one moment of regret, don't lock yourself in. God's not locking yourself in. It's for freedom that he has set us free. He came to bring us free. He came to heal. He didn't come for the healthy. He came for the sick. He came for the hurting. He came for those that are in pain. And you may have it all on the outside looking good, but we know on the inside, every one of us is fighting a battle. Why? Because we live in a sinful world. We live in a world that's fallen and we all have to fight the good fight and fight it in faith and declare his faithfulness and goodness over our lives. Declare his truth over your life that he's good, that he's faithful, that he's going to be faithful in the future. And I'm not saying just name it and claim it, but there is something about speaking good over your life because our words do form our worlds. And we need to be declaring like David, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. I won't be hijacked by difficulties. I won't be hijacked by moments of testing. I won't be sidetracked. I won't be pulling out. When I mess up, I won't stay away from God's house. No, surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life. Some of y'all just need to wake up tomorrow. Surely goodness and love will follow me today. What you look for, you'll probably find. What you expect, you'll probably receive. Passion isn't just an emotion, it is a choice. It is a choice that he deserves it, so I'm going to do it. He's worthy of it, so I'm going to give it to him. I'm not a victim. You can't be the victim and the victor at the same time, so stop thinking and talking like a victim. 
enter his gates with thanksgiving and praise. I've learned that the gates of life usually are painful moments, our difficulties, our challenges, our sacrifice moments. But guess what? The key to getting through those gates is praise. It's worship. It's having a thankful attitude. It's God, you're worthy of it, so I'm giving it to you. God, I'm going to give you all my life. I love you. I shout. I clap. I lift my voice. I pray. I sing because you're worthy of all the praise. Praise. 